It's a busy night, as you can tell when you came in. Um, we have our book fair tonight. It's Wendy's night. So our families are here, um, pur hopefully purchasing books and then going over to Wendy's and a proceed, some proceeds from that will go to our school as well. And then to have you all here, it's, it's very nice, so welcome. Um, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about our school. Here is our mission statement, and we are very committed to the relentless pursuit of excellence. And we're looking at, we, we call up our students, our scholars, and we are, um, we believe in every student, staff, and family member, and we're dedicating ourselves to creating a learning community that prepares our scholars for co college or career. And we really believe that for each and every one of our students, and it, we're passionate about it, and, and we work on that from day one. We want them to think about what they want to be when they grow up, and we want to prepare them for that as soon as they walk through our doors. Here are our, is our vision. We want our scholars to soar academically and socially, and we're looking for respect, responsibility, building relationships, and having pride in ourselves, our skills, our goals, and our school. And those are the things that we work on day in and day out. These are the things that we've been working on all year as we have built, worked to build a strong community of learners. This year, what, we're, what we've worked on mostly is building our community within our students. Because as you know, we've had students from two, mostly two schools, Twain and Grant Wood, um, but also from other student um, schools throughout the school district. So we've worked really hard to build that cohesive group of students. And it's been a challenge, but we have worked really hard on it. And we feel really good about where we are right now. We feel cohesive. Um, and this, we feel our students feel that pride in our community. Next year, our goal is to really work on merging our parent community and inviting them in much more. So that'll be our goal for next year. Um, this is the face of Alexander Elementary. We're at 395 students right now. That does include our preschool. Um, <coughs> we are at 53% black, 30% white, 13% Hispanic, 1% Asian, and we just have one American Indian student. Um, so that tells you a little bit about our school. We are at 74% free reduced lunch right now. So our goal is to continue to um, be passionate about our work, our students, our families. Our mantra is really we believe in each one of our students and our family members. We, we hired staff members who have that same belief and we wanted everybody that walked through our doors to have that same belief. And um, in the beginning when we first opened, we, our goal was for um, families to knock on the doors to get into our school, not knock on our, our doors to get out of the school. So that's what we're gonna keep fighting for here. So with that, um, we invite you to come anytime and um, walk through our hallways and, and visit our school. It's a, it's a good place. So, welcome. Thank you, thanks for doing that. Opening a new school is tough. So <laughs> kudos, kudos for that. All right, I call this meeting, the Education Committee, to, uh, to order. Um, present today, Kim Coleman, Recording Secretary, Lori Rotman, I'm Tom Yates, Chris Lynch, Brian Kershling, Latasha Deloach, Chris Liebig, for ICEA, Brady Shutt, Superintendent Steve Burley, Assistant Soups, Matt Degner, and uh, Amy Kortermeyer down at the end, this director, Phil anyway. He's not being punished, he just <laughs> And uh, Monique Simon is also oh, here. For and um, I'm sorry, hi Monique. And technically Monique is also here for uh, ICEA. Yeah, you, got, you got to get here early and sit at the table. Is this room here? I'll wait for you. I need A reminder before we... A reminder before we get uh, too far into the agenda, we will be stopping tonight at uh, 10 till 6 for the purpose of giving ourselves a little break before we have the, uh, for the work session, so we will get as far in the agenda as we can and uh, kick some other things down the road, I suppose, if there's any uh, 
uh, pressing need to move something on the agenda. We've done that before. We can do it again. Um, uh, up in, in today's agenda for any reason. But uh, I hope everybody's had a chance to take a look at the minutes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. The minutes I have been uh, motion to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 That carries. All right. First item on the agenda today is the summer school program. So tonight, um, just as part of our ongoing discussion about summer school, I've invited Joan Vandenberg and Amy Mentier to talk a little bit about uh, what's happened in the district in, in the recent years, as well as what we're planning for this coming slideshow. Here you go. And then from the beginning. <coughs> Great. Um, we're so happy to be here because we love talking about summer, unlike people who ever talk about Eli and they don't like talking about summer at all. Um, so uh, we've, um, we're really happy with the program that we've developed um, for summer over the past few years, and I think we want to get into a little bit about how we can potentially collaborate with our Eli program. Um, there, we kind of base our, our program on research from Johns Hopkins University that two-thirds of the achievement gap in ninth grade can be attributed to what did not happen in the summer months during elementary school. So I don't think I have time for my little step exercise. Um, <laughs> get off the yeah, yeah, it would be a hassle. But because um, sometimes we do this thing, we'll do this little exercise about how far behind our kids get because they don't have something going on in the summer. And so, you know, if you just think about this, you know, families with resources send their kids to camp, they go on family vacations, they do the summer reading <coughs> program, they do all these really nifty, enriching building things. And if you don't have much money and you don't have good child care, frequently the kids are not doing as many things as what we would like to see them do. So this is our, kind of our attempt at filling the gap of what happens during those elementary years. Um, and we really are trying to prevent that summer slide, which research shows the kids slide back in reading every, every fall, um, as well as in math. So, um, kind of the history on this is we got our first 21st Century Community Learning Centers grant in the year 2000, which is an after-school program. It's a federal competitive grant. Um, and at that time, you'll remember, we actually had a full-fledged summer school program that cost a lot of money. Um, so we didn't really include much summer in our program. And really the, the goal of that is to just provide those academic enrichment opportunities for those kids, particularly those in high poverty, low performing schools. So, you know, long story short, summer school got cut, and then in 2010, ACT and Pearson wanted to do something for us for their 25th anniversary, and so Lane Pluggy at that time suggested that we do a summer program. So we had 120 kids that we enrolled at our 21st century school sites back then, um, and so that's kind of our beginning, and then um, just recently we've been using some early literacy funding to kind of pilot some of our summer work. So fast forward, um, this past summer, in 2015, we served 335 students, and Amy really does the heavy lifting on this, and I also just want to add that we're super excited that we're here at Alexander because we just found out that we got our 21st Century Schools program for here. And, and it was, Amy did lots and lots of really hard work and, you know, a very long proposal, lots of details to write. Um, so that means we have a, a program here for the next five years and it's all told 600,000 bucks. So um, it's so apropos that we're here talking about it. So anyway, <laughs> take it away, Amy. You can talk a little bit about the programs and, yeah. and how uh, you serve. I'll just start with Alexander. Right now we serve about 40 kids in the BASAP, and now with the 21st century, once we blend, we hope to serve around 100 after school and 60 in the summer. So as you can see, we started with 120 students um, in 2010, and this summer we project to serve around 390 students at these sites. You can see two question marks. We're not going to be at Weber this summer, but we hope to scholarship some of the students. We work a lot with the Pheasant Ridge kids in the past, so we hope to scholarship them into some of our other sites. Um, they're doing construction work there. And then also Coral Grove Central we've been talking about working with. But these are the sites listed, and then how many we hope to serve at each site as well. And working around summer projects has been some of the 
favorite things that Amy gets to worry about. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't be in a building, and it's a time when we're trying to catch up and yeah. do projects, so it's that's a, a challenge. Of pieces. So, um, just to walk you if guys through. If, if it was 120 in 2010, what was it in 2000 when it started? Oh, in the summer program? Oh, that's a very good question. Result? Um, for when back in the old Norman Coleman era. Oh. But it was hundreds. Like it was hundreds. Also, yeah. it was higher number. But it was the more that was, it was different funding. It was different. It, it, it was well, it was general fund. It was general and fund. General. Okay. Yeah. So I would say more than two hundred, at least. Yeah. And it was it was yeah that that would I'd have to go off into no, it's small holes. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of yeah. Let's just enrichment Yeah. Or, and. It was at two sites in the district, so we had to provide transportation to get to those two sites. And it wasn't the same teachers teaching the kids, and so there were many complicating factors. So did that roll right into 2010, or was there a gap? In the oh, there was a big gap. There was there was a gap where we didn't have any summer at all, and so I think that's why Lane proposed that we... So where was the gap? What was the years? Um, I think we stopped doing summer in um, 2007. So it really restarted in 2010, 120, and now it's 630, yeah. or 360. Well, if I can chime in if there are <coughs> some questions as we go. Uh, on the 120 that you did in 2010, uh, did you track the progress and, and what type of uh, mm -hmm. uh, success did you have? Yeah, we have data from previous years, and we always show positive data. I mean, every year was a little bit different depending on what curriculum we choose, whether we had school day teachers or not. So every year, every year has looked a little different, but it's always been positive. One we'll of have the data slides. Still. What we what we like to do um, with those is kind of where are they now? You know, because I I would be interested to know now. That's you know, six years ago. Um, and we'll, we'll get to the data slide too, but we're getting some help with evaluation to do some of that because we've had some help with that. So. All right, so I'll just walk you through what a typical summer day looks like for our students. They come in around, um, some come as early as 7.30, but around 8.30 is when our breakfast starts. We offer breakfast to all the kids and then do a, a recess and our teachers arrive at 9 a.m. We have three hours of academics where they do an hour and a half of math and an hour and a half of reading and within that is our three different rotations so they'll be with a teacher in a small group maybe one on four they'll also be doing work with a para something that the teacher plans and then a lot of times they'll also be in the computer lab um, for their third rotation and we like to hire certified teachers from those buildings that's who we always open it up to first and our data shows great improvement. Obviously, when we hire those teachers, they already know the kids, they know where they're struggling. So right now, I'm in the process of hiring all those teachers at our sites. Once, if we don't fill with the school day teachers from those buildings, then we open it up to the rest of the district. Um, after their rotations, they have lunch and recess, and then we do the enrichment <coughs> rotations. We work with different community partners. Um, so like Iowa Children's Museum will come in, Johnson County Extension will come in, and do a lot of STEM and art activities. They go to the pool twice a week. We also offer different clubs, so we can bring in and contract with people who might do dance lessons. We've done Taekwondo in the past, cooking clubs, all sorts of stuff, music, art. Um, the kids love it. And then Friday is our all-day field trip. And so each week we try and do a theme. So if our week is water and they're learning about water and the environment, that week we might go to Lost Island um, the zoo is another place the kids love to go. We go to Putnam Museum, Bowling, Children's Museum, a lot of different places. And that's really, you know, we always talk about the summer slide and the academics, but I think bringing in that background knowledge is so crucial. A lot of our kids can read about an elephant all day long, but until they go and see that elephant, it's not going to register the same. Some of our kids have never seen a barn, so we get them out. And I mean, just even going downtown Iowa City can be a really fun field trip for a lot of our students. So it's something that they enjoy. We don't sentence them to this. They start asking in January, maybe in the summer program, and it's something they really look forward to, which is wonderful. Um, here's some outcomes from last year, and we worked with the DRA. I worked with the instructional coaches to get this data. So we collected, and this is what I have to show for my federal report as well, um, the improved reading level for DRA. So we took their spring 2015 and then again fall 2015 
And here it shows the level that decreased was 27%, and then maintained or improved level from spring to fall was 73%. And that's just from last summer. Can I ask a quick question? Of course. Is, there, is it possible instead of using acronyms to actually use the actual words? Because Diagnostic <laughs> reading assessment. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, I apologize. Yes. Of course. So and it's always, yeah. It, so if it's other ones, if you would yes. mind. Yes. Absolutely. Tired. Right. Yes, diagnostic reading system. And then here are some different um, partners that we use. Um, our newest partner is the University of Iowa Center for Evaluation and Assessment, which we're very excited. The grant, um, you have to have an outside contractor to evaluate your program. And in the past, Ron Muir was our evaluator, but he has since left Iowa City. So we are now going to work with the University of Iowa and is what they do and so we'll be having grad students come into our program and um, working with the professors and, there and they also are evaluating some of the ELI or they're in partnership in evaluating that so it's a nice tie-in with that so we're really excited about that because we have struggled a little bit with evaluation we lost our evaluator we used to have a data manager in the district and so we're super excited that we have a partner that's going to help us get this um, organized yeah and then our um, sites are also now, they used to be separate. We would have 21st century site programs in the buildings, and then the BASAP, before and after school program, would run in the buildings. Um, now we are all blended, so we have one site, which is a lot better for the students. Um, so neighborhood centers of Johnson County, we blend with them at three different sites. And then the other ones, like Lucas and Kirkwood, we work with the parent-run boards there. Um, in partnership and then some other partnerships are the Iowa Children's Museum. We do work with the university in different departments and you can read the other ones, Johnson County Extension like I mentioned. And then you're talk about okay. the funding. Um, yeah, and so I think that there's great potential to have this support of Eli. And so, you know, we're required to do our program that we wrote the grant to do, which includes it's basically kindergarten through third grade who we've really targeted in our program. Um, and certainly we want to keep doing what we've done for them, the enrichment and the math components, but I feel like we could pool our resources on some of the other costs. Like if we have a bus going out into a neighborhood to pick up 21st century schools kids, we could probably pick up the Yale kids as well. And maybe um, look at blending, you know, Kirkwood and Coralville Central and Wickham. You know, the, we'd have one site that would serve more than the grant kids and kind of have economy of scale that way. Um, and I, I do believe um, that there could be some additional community support. I had an interesting meeting last week of a group of business people that was interested in supporting Corville schools, and we landed on summer as a way that they could, you know, it's basically about $1,000 per kid for a five-week program. So you could, if you were a small business, you could maybe partner with someone else to fund you know, a kid, or you could, if you're a large business, maybe you can fund five kids. So I think there's potential for some fundraising opportunities, and Susan, uh, Brennan, and I have talked a little bit about if, if that would be something that we could do. Because I think it's really important. I don't, I don't like the punitive nature of Eli and how it is now, and so can we make this be an enrichment program as well as an academic program? Because I think one of the things that Amy touched on, kids like this, and, it, and we kind of re-engage them and get them excited about learning, which is kind of a huge issue for some of our kids who aren't proficient. Sometimes we we don't make it fun to learn. So I think there's huge potential for that. Um, and uh, so the funding resources that we talked about, <laughs> I had a summary page of the budget and I left it on the printer. But it's 21st century schools is kind of the foundation and we tend to use those um, schools for the, the base of the funding. Our local sales tax money, the SAVE money, is also used through our community ed program. So, for example, at Mann and Lemmy, we use some SAVE dollars because we don't have the 21st century schools. At Lemmy, we also work with um, Johnson County because they had a program specifically for Breckenridge. So, whenever possible, we try to partner with other groups. At that time, Lemmy, they were like out in the cornfield and they weren't getting any academics at all for their summer program. So, why not bring that in and, you know, Kind of do double duty with that. So as much as possible, we look for those partnerships that could be um, you know, good for our kids. And like I said, private donations. We had ACT and Pearson in the past. I think there's potential for the future. And then also, um, in the blended programs, the parents who need childcare pay for it. I mean, they they still pay their childcare um, as they would even if if this wasn't a 21st century schools program. And I 
really think that's great too because when we first did this in 2000, you know, the kids whose parents could afford childcare were over here and the kids who couldn't were in our program and it was, it was icky. I mean, I think everyone benefits by being together. So, um, and currently um, we use the Eli money for our, the teachers in the program, so. And you can, you can walk me through the program. I just wanted to say I love this picture, but this is a picture of the garden at Wood um, that we use 21st century funds to start and the kids go out there and love it and the garden is wonderful, so you'll have to visit that as well. But they would make salsa and I mean, they did a, a fabulous job there. Jared, who now works here, was overseeing it then. Um, this is just at the end of every summer, we do a parent survey and get feedback from them. And this is just a quote that a Kirkwood parent wrote. It said, the summer program is a wonderful program to have my seven-year-old in. I struggled to keep her mind busy in the summer and was worried about her losing what she had worked so hard to accomplish during the school year. When I received the phone call that there was a spot for her, I wanted to scream. I was so happy that the school was able to offer us a spot and that there are teachers wanting to help our students in the summer months. Thank you very much for the program. It is the best, which is always nice to hear. And then just a 21st century student. We also had do student surveys, and this child, just what, how they would change it is make it last longer. <laughs> so any questions now? Looking forward to another great summer. This was taken at the Niall. So what would you need from us for the, the opportunity is to <coughs> What would you need for us to take it to the next opportunity? Um, well, uh, we're just in some kind of preliminary discussions about fundraising, but um, you know, and I know there are other goals the district may have on fundraising, but uh, if this could be considered as a priority, because um, I think that especially the more kids we try to serve, the more that we need, and I know the general budget is um, tight in this thing. Uh, and I'm really excited about the um, university helping us with the evaluation, but that's something that sometimes we run a little thin on staff time to just do good evaluation. So funding wasn't a constraint for the kids that be in this program? Mm -hmm. <sighs> that's a very good question. I would say, uh, <coughs> maybe a lot more. I mean, this is just seven of the buildings, so. All of our non professional students. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. 400 kids at the elementary level, so you know, you get a 50% participation rate of 3,700 kids. Could you talk a little bit about the funding streams that are used to support the 360 or so students? And with those grants, she was sharing with me that it's very specifically <coughs> written to particular grade levels. So as we think about the third grade requirement for next year, and again, we've got that piece hanging out there, with whether we'll apply for the waiver or not. Um, but you know, we can't necessarily shift what's happening with the funding streams there, right, over to third grade. And so there is going to be that journal fund piece that um, we'll have to support the third graders in, in other instances. One of the things <coughs> that we've been talking about, um, and I don't know, Joan and Amy, if you heard any of the discussions about it so far, but. We've been talking about trying to get more community involvement, perhaps through businesses or um, other kinds of support groups to just have uh, people come and do reading and support kid reading as, as many places in as many ways as possible throughout the summer so that we uh, don't end up backsliding. And um, I don't think we're looking at that as being a, a cost burden the way we've talked about it so far but again one of the one of the organi organizational issues is how to get those people lined up and um, um, what can we do to, to make sure they're they're going to do what they say they're going to do um, we talked about the debut program uh, a little bit do we have any more info on that I've, I've been looking at it. Um, okay. They call it the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, and it's really more of a national initiative. And I don't know if this is unique to Dubuque or if it's what they focus on nationwide, but they really um, are looking at attendance and ensuring that kids are getting to school on time and that they're there to learn. So that's kind of the focus of 
that program. And as I looked at um, who, who we could tap into in Iowa, there's a, a name and a gal out of Ames, Iowa. So I don't know if that's anything we want to pursue. I do see United Way attached to that a little bit. But there is great interest um, from United Way to support us in literacy. And we just met with Patty Fields yesterday and, and attending our Education Commission meeting again tomorrow. So I know they're interested in supporting that work. The Chamber of Commerce has um, brought some people together also on the literacy side of things to support something. Um, I've been attending those meetings recently as well. So I think if we can come up with an idea, we've got people out there willing to support that. And it's just what you definitely would want to kind of try to take Good. Uh, I think we throw the largest lasso we can and try and catch as much as we can. I was going to um, use the word net. Well, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Western guy, right. Tom. Uh, but uh, I think also we got to get, you know, if we're a city of uh, literature and with UNESCO, we got to get them involved with this as well. Uh, make it a, a, a true community effort. And uh, yeah, and there's no problem with going to businesses to help. Uh, to try and get some uh, funding that way. Um, when you were talking uh, in your list of partners, you have the Antelope uh, Lending Library, the mobile bookmobile. Do you take them to the public library downtown? Yeah, we do. Okay, and to great. the Coralville Library. Yeah, fantastic. Now, do you make sure they get a library card? Do they have a library card? Yep. Fantastic. We... I, think, I think that needs to be uh, almost at every uh, school registration and that uh, we work with the library and see if they can have a little table there that after you register your kids for school to make sure they have a library card if they don't. So, I'm curious yeah. about the schools where you're not doing the program, right? So to apply for, for the grant, you have to be um, at a certain percentage of free reduced lunch, mm -hmm. so a lot of them don't qualify for the 21st mm -hmm. century. And then the children in those schools that need the enrichment, are they able to enroll in the other schools' programs or, or not? No, it's no. The so there's just nothing for them. Mm -hmm. Some of the BASAPs run during the summer, mm -hmm. some don't. It's kind of just site specific. And, and the BASPs are not doing reading and right. math with right. certified teachers. Right. So, I mean, they're great programs, but they're not doing right. what you're doing. It's child care, a place to go, mm -hmm. they just don't. Right. Care. They do field trips. Yeah. Oh, they do wonderful oh, things. Yeah. <laughs> they do tremendous programs. My, my daughter's in it, so I, I love it. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, I, I just am wondering how we could get the kids that need the enrichment from the other schools where they're not having the program, how we could get them. And I know with our uh, legislation that's going to come, mm -hmm. but you know, every summer that goes by is time lost. Mm -hmm. So love to find a way to get those kids in sooner. And through our community ed program, which clearly we're left with this, I think we're looking at an RFP to incent some of the BSAPs to do more enrichment for kids who can't afford it. Sure. And then if there's enough of them, shoot in a tutor. But you know, again, it's going to require a little bit more money than what we have. Yeah. But that would be the vision. Because there's, you know, sometimes it's the middle of the road schools that I kind of feel the worst about. Because some of the really high SAT schools don't have as much need. And the low ones have 21st century schools grant, but it's the it's the middle of the road ones that frequently have a, a population of kids who need some help and, mm -hmm. and families, but they don't have but they don't qualify for some. Of and what changed at Weber and Corville Central this year that you're not offering the program? I mean, I know at Corville Central they're like all torn apart, so well, physically it's not. Well, the Weber program used to be possible. Roosevelt, so then when they oh. moved, so then Weber didn't qualify to rewrite the grant, so we used other local funds. Um, and this year, they're just the Weber program's not going to be there. And the neighborhood centers, they used to run the program with us. They're not doing the program there. So. They lost their AmeriCorps grant. So there, it's a combination of not having a space at Weber and funding problems. Um, and Corville Central, we might be able to scholarship a few kids in at Kirkwood from Corville Central. And it kind of depends on if these guys really come through with the money that they're talking about. So <laughs> we'll see. That's what we're. We'll, just, we'll see. That's why there's a big well, question mark right there's now. There's somebody we can talk to. to mm -hmm. Let us know. Mm -hmm. if we need some letters or phone calls or whatever the, we can do. For the 21st century program, so you, you, the spots are limited to kids who are not proficient in mm -hmm. one or the other. Is that how it works for you in math? Typically, it's been teacher referral for not proficient. Teacher referral. Mm -hmm. And then, but of course, you're not required to do it, right? 
right? I mean, right. No. What, do you have an issue with sort of having people that you wish would take you up on the offer? But There's always that. It's kind of a letter sent home. Congratulations, your child has been selected by their school day teacher to be a part of this wonderful program. Um, you know, if we send home 50, we'll probably get 40 back. Yeah. And a lot of times when they can't, it's just because they're not in town during the summer. Right. I would think just the child care aspect alone of it would be absolutely right. Yeah, um, we noticed the bell change too. You know, because there are some parents, you know, that I think particularly at Kirkwood, our numbers were down for right. after school. For after yeah. school, because and you know, whatever, the kids could be home, I'll be home. It, 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 right. was, it had an impact on them. Um, summer, I think, less so than after school. Don't you think? Anything else on this topic? Uh, so I wonder, Steve, maybe is a recommendation here, or is this something we want to actively talk with the foundation and the United Way and everybody else, or what's the? We're in those conversations right now. One part of it is for us to figure out what kind of scale of support they're talking about. Are they talking about in-kind support? Are they talking about monetary support? The chamber group really wants to focus on literacy. Uh, the uh, group of uh, business community members that have been involved in uh, individual conversations with the schools. The question is, are they looking at a global solution? Are they looking at a school-specific solution? So part of it is to better understand the scope of support that's out there. We know what that looks like from, my, uh, especially in terms of the monetary support, and that helps us figure out what we can do inside the system. So we're still working on figuring out what that looks like. I mean, that's their end of it, but our end of it would be what's the compelling business need, I'll say in business terms, but what's the compelling educational need? Oh, you know, we know that. that. Is, that on one page, is that on a one page or I can talk to the foundation or you can put that together? Yeah. I think it's the business case on our end where what is our compelling need? And I know we can get people to plug into it, but I hear you. we got to get a feel for what they're thinking, too. But You know, we can talk to death what the legislation says, too, about this offering in the summer of third grade where that impact, I mean, even if we get the kids to attend at 85% for the 70 hours, we're still not going to get our bank or our buck if we were doing that intensive of a program at kindergarten first, second grade. So if you're talking about like a big picture, what we would love to see starting at kindergarten and offer that at that point. Yeah, yeah. preschool early. The compelling, the compelling need is here. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I don't think the discussion should be only pushed by what we're going to be required to do by the mm -hmm. I'm not even and and, and uh, so I mean, we we should recognize it's something we need to do. We 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 even if Des Moines folds on it, it doesn't mean that we abandon it. So it, it's something we should be in for the long haul. Yeah, I forget about Des Moines. This is yeah, what we would yeah. need to do. So, so, and when we first had those conversations with, with Pearson and ACT, one of the things that we asked them is, "What's your buy-in over the long haul? Because we want to build something that's sustainable over time." So. They were really good with us, you know, when they first came in and saying they moved into a multi-year uh, uh, set of support for kids, and then they came back every year. We went out, we showed them what we were doing, so that they were convinced that indeed this is something they wanted to continue to fund moving forward. So as we have those conversations with the folks from the chamber and the other business community members in town, it's not what can you do for us this summer, but what can you sustain over time so that we can actually build a program that meets the kids' needs um, that has some longevity and some staying power. This is very smart, but it's just strength free. So, how many kids would you have in kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three? Is it a thousand kids overall? Or is it mm -hmm. Remember, our uh, uh, substantially efficient number yeah. of the state is uh, about a third of our population uh, at the uh, third grade. If you extrapolate that out, if you were to get 7,300 kids at the 7,400 kids at the elementary level, so about a third of those kids would benefit substantially from reading. But then you also have to keep in mind those are only the language arts kids that are substantially deficient. When you look at the math, you're going to have some overlap, but there's going to be some independent kids there who can benefit from math remediation. So it's likely going to be higher. So you could be looking at 40% of your elementary population have a definite need for remediation. They also talked about the enrichment <coughs> aspects that go along with it. And, and it's not just the kids uh, uh, in that substantially deficient area that are seeing that summer slide. All of our kids see it to some degree. So you know, in the end, universal summer school is what I've been arguing with the legislature since I got here. Um, but at least 40 to 50 percent of our kids have benefited from being in it uh, every year. Yeah, so like up to 3,000. So I, I think I shared this with some of you that would have been um, at the legislative meeting on Friday night. Um, if you just think about our current second graders who will be under this uh, law next year for the first time, 
During the winter benchmark, we have 66% of our kids proficient. Now that is not our number of kids that are substantially deficient, that's just who is uh, not are proficient. So that was about 375 um, kiddos. Remember from that group, um, again, we don't know over um, who was designated in that group that's substantial deficient, so who would have not met that criteria two um, testing periods in a row. And then from there, we, have, we don't have the mechanism yet that pulls out which kids would be exempt from that. So, and we've got a full, you know, another year to continue to intervene and provide good, strong instruction. So, but that's just kind of an idea of where that current group is based on this fast assessment, on this fast assessment. I mean, what I was sort of take these state proficiency numbers is a given. Mm -hmm. When we start talking about kindergarten as not being proficient in reading, I mean, isn't it natural that some people at age five and a half mm -hmm. would necessarily be, you know, I mean, is that to some Absolutely. extent, is that developmentally? How much do we want to push that at the young ages? Well, and their, their subtests look different than what our second graders would take. So you're, you know, looking at letter, sound, relationship, um, sentence, reading. So subtests that are more specific to, at the kindergarten or first grade level, they have four subtests that we're um, looking at. So that's kind of all combined into a composite. That's, I think I should do that. That's uh, I'm kind of curious is what is their expectation for the kindergarten? Uh, I have to look at their composites more, but yeah. I mean, there's not like they're only reading a paragraph at that point. There's still, you know, subtests where there's letter ID. Letter, well, that's, letter ID. And that's why when you look at the ideal, and the ideal you'd have a universal summer school and build the hall because uh, then there is either a remediation or enrichment component for math and for English language arts, and then there are those extension opportunities uh, that they talked about where we get kids involved in um, fine arts and, and uh, PE and other things like that that um, expand their contextual knowledge base, which is going to help them with language acquisition. Uh, and then it's the partnering with the community agencies so that we can get them out of the building. Uh, again, they increase their experience uh, level and, and build that contextual knowledge base. So that's the ideal world. I mean, I guess I'm just thinking some, you know, have the kids behind where this proficiency number isn't in the kindergarten. It might be because, you know, they end up what they need. But might just be that's the rate at which that kid is developing. Mm -hmm. I don't know just that out. So. so these subtests do change, but at the end of kindergarten, they're being tested on letter sounds, word segmenting, nonsense words, and sight words, 50 sight words. So if we talk this a month from now, what does progress look like? Is That's a good question. Kind of what I'm hoping yeah. around. Um, well, some of it will be where we are in terms of the program in place going forward, but um, I'm, I'm interested in that net being cast uh, across the district to see who really is interested in doing yeah, and they're going to look to us for some guidance here. But what kind of what kind of community reading uh, involvement can we get? I mean, literally, so that they're just people. I mean, if they're reading groups someplace every once in a while, you know, just with uh, uh, with people, not necessarily working with with kids necessarily, but just. Insisting on uh, reading or doing reading out loud or uh, whatever it is to keep everybody going. We work with the RSVP during the school year. Who also works during the school day? They come into our after-school programs, and then retired teachers that yeah. I've reached yeah. out to, and then the university. I mean, it's such a huge sure. for students to come in and put in those hours that are here during the summer. But isn't there a monthly meeting of retired teachers, Tom? Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be yeah. a fantastic resource yeah. if we have a talk to them. It's been my experience to just need to have a good training and and then ongoing support for volunteers because if they start to feel like they're not supported or mm -hmm. valued you sure. lose them and, and yeah. so in, and connecting with them and helping them feel find their niches it's it can be kind of time consuming because you kind of want to match the volunteer with sure. the right experience mm -hmm. were you thinking k6 or what generally yeah, yeah. The fifth sixth graders are a whole other animal. <laughs> <laughs> we will defer to our junior high teachers to consult with on that one. <laughs> yeah, we know with our report we have uh, significant numbers of juniors that can't read. And uh, I think we need to look at the, the whole scope because I don't think those juniors are going to get caught up in their senior year. I'd like to think so, but I don't think so. No. And I, and I, 
I think the EA lit on the agenda you're talking about the ELL. I think those students have too many challenges that I'd love to see more opportunities for them. Well, and I'd be interested too, you spoke of longitudinal data. Uh, if we have any longitudinal data on the programs that were done when we had larger numbers in the Marion Coleman area, we were using general funds. Mm -hmm. And also to look at these recent programs to see exactly how well we track through and if there's ways in between what we do. Does anyone know who was in the program back in the day? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 who participated? Because we know who participated in 2010 with our program. I don't know if I can go back and figure out who participated in the old family program. There's a lot of junior high kids. Junior high kids? Yeah. I don't know if it's possible. If it's possible. If it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, um, some would be easier to get than others. Sure. Um, the one thing that we've run into a little bit with this is that. Um, with high mobility, sometimes we just, you know, we started out with 60 kids, and in the end we're down to like 15, and then is that a representative sample? I mean, there, there's kind of that issue. As we get more numbers, then that should help us. I think mobility will always be an issue for this district. Yeah. It, this, it's our biggest challenge. If we could do away with mobility. Can you work on that, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> and I think maybe on our next agenda is going to be year-round schools. So I think that might be something that might have a positive impact on mobility. I don't know. Possibly. Good. Good. Anything else on this one? Thank you, oh, Jones. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. This is an ongoing conversation, but we really, you know, we. Appreciate what's been done so far. We gotta keep, we gotta keep this up because yeah. uh, we don't. Well, we don't have any choice really. <laughs> so there's that. We really don't. <laughs> Failure is just not an option here. Uh, Lisa. <coughs> Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I actually do want to hear I've got paper handouts if anyone wants to pass that down. Do you want one, Kim? Yeah. Oh. Lisa, just so you know before you start, we're, we're really hoping for an ongoing set of uh, informational presentations by the ELL okay. as we move forward sure. uh, too. So um, I'm looking over your <laughs> slide thing. You're not going to try to do the details all at once. We're not going to try to good. do it all today. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to give you a little bit of overview and updates on what's been happening locally and at the state level because we've had a lot of change recently. Just kind of catch up to speed. So just for the bigger picture, I'm going to start with a graph that shows the Grantwood AEA on the top and Iowa City Community School District on the bottom numbers. And 2011-12, uh, as you can see, the um, numbers of ELL for AEA in um, total was 1,256 and we were 434, about a third of the whole AEA. Now if you'll see where we're at on well, this, as of but today we actually have third 1,315 ELL students in the district, so that's increased since the BEDS report. But we are about half of the AEA as far as EL levels now. So we've had a substantial increase. And um, in 11-12, we had 10.74 FTE, and now we've got 36.4. So we've hired a lot of teachers along the way. Substantial growth. As of now, we have 13 elementary schools, and we're adding Van Allen to our programming in the fall. We've got Northwest Junior High and Southeast Junior High with anticipating North Central in the future as we open Liberty High. Um, City High, West High, and as I mentioned, 13, 15 students. Students from over 70 language backgrounds, and our predominant languages are Spanish, Swahili, French, Arabic, Chinese, and Vietnamese, but obviously <coughs> a lot more languages. One of the district requirements, and this is a requirement for all districts in the United States, is to develop what is called a Lao plan. This is named after a U.S. Supreme Court case, Lao versus Nichols, uh, 
74 with Chinese American students who felt discriminated against because they didn't understand what was happening in the classroom and they didn't have any access to education because the district and teachers and staff weren't doing anything different for those students so they could understand what's going on. So what is required now is that districts develop this plan that um, specifically lays out what we're doing to serve our students. How are we meeting their needs? And then every year the plan must be reviewed and revised. The LAO plan for our district is available on the website through the curriculum link. Um, another thing I'd like to know that is that on January 7, 2015, all um, superintendents in the entire United States received a, uh, a letter with a link to a 40-page document from the Office of Civil Rights and Department of Justice laying out some of the, um, the issues and providing some guidance for districts on meeting compliancy where English language learners are concerned. And so one of, I'm gonna say, some of the big rocks for us, we're really looking at meaningful access to gifted programs and like students shouldn't be excluded because they don't have proficiency in the language. We need to make sure that our students also have access to AP classes, clubs, everything that all other students have access to. Um, we're also paying real close attention to making sure we're not entitling students for special education based on lack of language proficiency. Um, we also have to be um, aware that we have to provide support for stu students to develop their language proficiency even in the cases where parents have waived services. Parents have a right to deny services and say I don't want my child in that program but even when they do that the weight goes on to the district to find other ways to develop their language proficiency and we do have a number of students who are waived. Um, in the past in, um, a couple years ago, the federal government came in and audited the state of Iowa. There were about 16 citations in these eight main areas here. Um, as a result of those citations, there have been a lot of changes and a lot of weight that has come down onto all districts for the, to make those changes. Um, one thing that happened is the state of Iowa did not have uh, language language proficiency standards laid out that all districts were implementing. So the state now has those and as a result, the English language learner teachers were responsible for uh, receiving training in the first three modules of those standards. There will be six modules in all. And then next year, all staff in the district, in all districts, anyone who works with an English language learner will be responsible for that same training. So there'll be a lot of training going on for content classroom teachers and not just ELL teachers. Another thing that happened um, is that in the past, when a district was not meeting the AMAOs, the Annual Measurable Achievement Objectives, there weren't really any sanctions. And so the government has said, we've got to do something different about that. If we're not meeting our targets, then we've got to have you know, we've got to do something different and be accountable for that. And one other thing that has happened is they, at State of Iowa used to have something called a transition period. When we thought kids were ready to not receive services, we kind of watched them for a while before they officially exited. Um, the government said, we can't do that. Either you're in or you're out. Once students have exited, we, we are now required to monitor them for two full years to make sure they're maintaining success in their classes. If not, we come back and consider whether they need to go back into services. In the left column, you'll see the targets for the state of Iowa for AMAOs, growth and proficiency. That would be for growth in the English language, um, as well as um, growth in reading and math and Iowa assessments. Iowa City has missed those targets as well as the number of students who have reached proficiency. We are on year four of missing targets, so if we do not meet the targets next year, we would be on year four plus and we'll have to make some changes. Why this is happening? Well, I think if we look at our substantial growth and think about the demographics in the district and how they've changed, that could answer some of our questions. We've had a lot of refugee students come in. We've had students come in with limited and interrupted educational experiences. 
we've had more challenges that way. And so a lot of our kids are really playing catch up um, and they're not meeting those targets. So what's that 50% mean? Does that mean 50% proficient? 50.21% and our target right was 63.4. So it's proficient, it's not necessarily growth. Right, it's just okay. proficient. Well, and this one actually is the number of, who has, of students who have made growth and we want to see 63% that have made growth. So half, okay. the kid, half the kids made growth. Right. Okay. Right. So we are making growth, just not what the state wants us to make because every year those targets increase. If you can see that by next year, we should be at 64.7, <coughs> 66. So it gets really difficult as our population changes. We have more kids with more needs, we're getting more kids, and they keep raising the bar. We keep trying, <laughs> we're fighting, you know, we're working at it, but that just means we need to go back and think about what can we do differently? So How so else can we help those kids? What does the that look like if that's what's actually, if you're right about sort of what's the fruit of the problem? <coughs> what do you do for a corrective action? Does okay. it mean more, yeah. is it more money, or does it just mean a different approach? Well, um, what we're doing for corrective action plan, which the state is actually requiring, is that districts who are at year four plus are providing foundational background teaching and serving English language learners to all staff. And so right now, that's a possibility for August. We're waiting for more guidance from the state on that. They may be developing that professional development for the state and rolling that out. So we're not gonna reinvent the wheel. They don't want us to. But when they do send that out, the guidance for that, that's our plan. We're gonna provide more training for all teachers, not just ELL teachers, because there isn't really a teacher in this district now who doesn't have an English language learner in the classroom. Um, another thing that we're doing is, yes, the ELP standards training is going to help everyone meet needs of students as well. We send more people to Iowa Culture and Language Conference, attendance at uh, our Kids Summer Institute, which is a <coughs> summer program in Waukee that has a lot of ELL professionals that come and present for content teachers. We're also, um, we have some administrators in the academy. Amy's actually in the academy right now. Um, and we're also expanding SIOP training, which is Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol. So it's sheltered instruction where teachers are learning how to meet the needs of kids. Not all, I mean all kids, not just ELLs, but specifically it does help ELLs. And we've had some secretary training. So these are just some of the things we do with corrective action. We also look at our curriculum, we look at our instruction, um, we look at whatever we can, and we are consistently making those changes. Do you have more questions for me before? So what helps what help you from us? What would help look like from us? Here's Amy. <laughs> <laughs> It really goes hand in hand too with what Joan was talking about because we have so many of our kids who are in this, these programs who are ELL students. Learning language, lack of experiences, background knowledge. So all, everything that she's doing, her group is doing, her team is doing is helping these kids because these are the same kids. <laughs> so I think uh, for me it's just having that understanding and awareness um, how quickly we've grown and how much we've um, because of that student growth had to expand our staff. Right. When the district hired Lisa, when first time I've been here now, it's my fourth year. Fourth year. She, you know, just think about what she's experienced in that time. And so, um, you know, us being uh, mindful of what the state targets are, trying to figure out, uh, do we have the right curriculum in place that she was talking about? The fact that we have so many languages um, for our staff to <coughs> understand what the best ways to, to teach, that's through the SIOP training. Um, I, I think there's so many um, pieces. Mm -hmm. With the state's citations, I think it ends up being a, a good thing for us. I actually think it ends up being a good thing for our district as we go to look at our proficiency um, just overall, you know, our three subgroups, I continue to say, our African American kids, our special education kids, and our ELL kiddos, the, the state has really forced um, us to turn our ship towards looking at our ELL kiddos because of the citations that they've received at the federal level plus our corrective action plan looking at that 35 to 40 hours that we have for professional development next year, there's a huge chunk of it that's going to be devoted to ELL, and that's right. not necessarily a bad thing for our district. Part of that's through the corrective action plan, which will be in year four plus, and part of that's just the state standards. I think the tricky thing for us is um, that it's going, it is going to suck up a ton of our, our professional development um, time, and if you think about the elementary level in particular, you know we've got the ELI piece to um, push out as well, 
we're in our third year of um, implementing uh, a new science kit, so there's components with that. So our PD time is just getting whittled pretty quickly to things that are being kind of mandated or asked of us to do. And it's, it's all good stuff. I, I don't want to complain that way. But I think just the recognition of how where, where we've been in the uh, last few years and that um, this landscape has drastically changed in Iowa City and that we need to get our arms around this, understand what it means for our, for our kids and for our teaching staff. So how about this? So funding's not a constraint, right? Is it? No. Yes. Um, I'd have to have lean on Craig. <laughs> so <laughs> we do get to go to the SBRC for <coughs> being overextended with. Oh, that's where it's going. So funding's not a constraint, right? <laughs> you know, we do have a big constraint, though, and, and yeah. we and Lisa know this, and that's uh, actually finding certified yes. staff in this yes. here in the yes. state. There are a, there's an enormous shortage of teacher certified uh, language uh, learner instructors. Mm -hmm. Um, the state's got some very um, prohibitive practices for us, uh, teachers going to yeah. a lot of state to get licensed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it makes it very difficult for, uh, for those folks to get uh, uh, certification. So we've actually started having some conversations with some <laughs> area colleges and universities about where our opportunities might lie for them to help us uh, take uh, either teachers who are currently certified in teaching in the system and get them their ELL certification and also to work with new pre-service teachers so that they add that ELL mm -hmm. endorsement before they come out of college because we struggle every year to fill all of our ELL slots which mm -hmm. then change the caseload levels right. that we have for those teachers that are in the district. We could hire more teachers, which would, we'd have to go to the SBRC for the relief on that, but that would really change the caseloads, which would change some of the instructions they can use their kids. So that's one of the, the big lifts that we're working on right now. And years ago, we could use Title III funds to you know, to help provide certification for teachers who are already in the district, and now they've cut back. That's no longer allowable. So in order to take a teacher and help them get an endorsement, you know, we don't have the funds right off that we can use legally. I would I would encourage the board members too to go to uh, an ELL classroom at mm -hmm. the secondary Absolutely. level or the elementary level. It's a you know it's a phenomenal experience mm -hmm. and just the life experiences that our students have had as you know it's uh, pretty inspiring. Mm -hmm. So I I you know I taught sheltered uh, American studies for two years at last and it's it's. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You can talk I mean, from experience. Yeah, really, really <laughs> challenging, but it's so uh, rewarding. I think you know when we worked as you know the team building with strategic goals and you try to think about one or two or three things. I think that the sensitivity uh, that you'll have, but just what Amy's saying, you know, that understanding of where our students are at and their backgrounds that they come from, I think would really be enhanced as you look at a couple of those things maybe next uh, fall again by just you know at that easiest level just going in the classroom seeing talking to the students talking to the teachers yeah and, and i think this is another one that kind of falls under that same community partnership like we're exactly. talking with reading and this is a it's a challenge but it's also a great opportunity for us uh, the university of iowa has a spanish department it has a french department it has a chinese department uh, and trying to partner with them and get some participation that way uh, and we also can't, uh, or we, we need to recognize that the, the kids of, the, the parents of those kids probably have language challenges as well. Absolutely. And uh, what we can do to that, and that would pose challenges for participation in schools, <coughs> PTA, PTOs, that type of a thing. Uh, and, you know, we are a global uh, world anymore. This is a fan I, I, I look at it as a fantastic opportunity. I, I, I've been in some countries where they speak Swahili. That is fun. Uh, trying to do uh, jumbo uh, that way. And it doesn't matter how loud you talk, there's you know, <laughs> <laughs> still a problem. You understand. Right, right. Move the pipe for granted. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's uh, all kidding aside. Um, it, it, it is what our community is, it's what our world is getting to be, and, and uh, I think we, again, a big net or a large lasso uh, 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 is, is what's needed here and uh, trying to get as many uh, people involved with it. But I think we'll be, you know, we, here again, I think we should really be reaching out to the U and seeing what collaborative things we can do uh, there to you know, partnering students with Actually, with, we with, with, we, uh, we are having students. a conversation with the okay. university right. of Leah Plakins, and she has a grant, and she's offered us to be part of that grant where she's working with some grad students Excellent. to develop professional development. 
but this first year is going to be all of that development sure. planning and then the following year our district will be part of that plan where the university students are coming in Fantastic. and helping us we've Great. also had some volunteers from the spanish and french departments who've come in to help with some of our newcomers <coughs> and there have been some challenges with their schedules but, you know, right. we're, we're trying working with them that way. Well, and, and, and we also have just, you know, community members with, with, with Spanish language and, and, mm -hmm. and other people who, who enjoy just speaking the language and that interaction. Sure. So if we can do that type of partnering, like the same thing with the, just getting people to read the students. Mm -hmm. We're actually experiencing more of those, you know, the undocumented um, students, kids from Central America that are coming up, showing up here you know, trying, looking for a guardian, you know, haven't been to school for how long, and uh, we're seeing more of those kids. So the Spanish speakers are always welcome. Lisa, I've got a question about mm -hmm. the, um, about the achievement objectives. Mm-hmm. Um, is, are they looking for aggregate uh, numbers here? I mean, is this a K through 12 kind of growth, growth or proficiency target? It wouldn't include, yes, it would, but it would not include, um, in one of the AMOs, it would not include the 12th graders, of course, because they don't take the IO assessments. Okay. But they are looking at the number of students who make growth from one year to the next, and they're also looking at the number of students who hit proficiency. So there's a difference in the students. We want to see them make growth, but we also want to see, you know, a percentage of students who are really hitting that what we call a level six here, which would be proficient and they're exited from services. Right. Well, it seems to me something's not fair. Uh, oh, it's really not fair. <laughs> Talk to Des Moines about that. <laughs> They've got 6,000. But yeah, definitely not Moines fair. Is apparently deaf. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's, you know, you can do your best. Another thing to think about is that the students that the growth and such that is measured from year to year isn't necessarily the same. It's not necessarily the same students. Yeah, Some of them are, but with point. our mobility issues, you know, we have kids come and go all the time. You know, we have kids that, um, you know, have ac the, the difficulty is that when we have kids exit or become proficient, they're out of the data. We can't count those scores anymore. So all we have are the kids that are learning. So do we have so, any data on, so they entered at a certain grade level and four years later they're, you know what I mean? So you should actually track the kids that stay with us for a while? Or? We do have, we do have data. Does that tell you a different story or is it? Um, it will tell some different stories um, based on some of the changes. I mean, there have been a lot of changes at the state level along the way on how we looked at proficiency. Sure. So many years ago, um, districts weren't as accountable. They didn't have to report certain, you know, scores. Also, we had more districts had more flexibility on who was in the program and who was out of the program. So the numbers are going to going to look different. Now we don't have that flexibility at all. We, if there's another language spoken in the home, we screen. Legally, we have to screen the students. Before, there was a lot of flexibility on who we screen and don't screen. So. One, one learning piece for me, and um, because we're in this corrective action piece, we do have to have a district administrator as part of that ELL Academy mm -hmm. for two years. And um, I think it's every two months or so, mm -hmm. we watch a webinar. Joey Lawrence from the DE is pushing out information um, sh and then sets a homework assignment aside. And I think a, a big learning for me was how difficult it is for our, us to access our um, ELL data, our L521, our former test, saluting me right now and then being able to do those comparisons. So the state isn't really well set up. They're trying right now. Um, they've loaded some information into Ed Insight, but that's not easily um, accessible to us. And so that's a, a piece, a huge hurdle that I think the state is working on as well. They have that information more readily available to us. That, that assignment took quite some time to put together. For a district, right. size, especially, we're not talking about five kids in a small district. We have a huge number of kids that we're trying to look at and do some comparison data. <coughs> And yeah. guidance in the past from the state has been inconsistent. In the last four years, it's gotten a lot. It's gotten a lot. It's polite. And, and that's inconsistent yet politically correct. But in the last four years, it's gotten a lot better since they hired Joby Lawrence, and she's made a lot of changes there. But then also the federal audit, you know, all made made sure changes are happening. Iowa has to get on board. So we we feel the weight of that right now, but eventually it's. 
kind of curious about the with the Department of Justice letter where they say provide meaningful access to people with career and tech, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What does that mean on the ground, like concretely to provide? I'm thinking like with AP classes, those classes can be so really intensive. <coughs> What, what are they they can be. What they're really saying is that we don't have policy or rules that what they call chill, the chill factor that would exclude students so based on, on their la lack of proficiency. So we have to provide other ways that they can qualify. If you had a cut score to get right. into, an AP, right. into right. an AP class and you couldn't perform on that school on that test because of the language. language. Because of the 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 language. Right. Right, you'd have to look at some other multiple things. Certainly could be a student who is in that sort of a class in their home country. Highly intelligent students being excluded because of the language. So we have to find other ways to, to But once they're in the class, does that mean we have to do things to accommodate? We have to do things to accommodate, be? right. And that would be part of the law versus Nichols. Yeah. OCR says we have to accommodate, we have to differentiate, we have to uh, modify. We have to do what we need to make sure the kids have equal access. So that's where training for all teachers is just extremely important. Okay, you have a okay. Alexander piece here. So my three colleagues, and Marcy and Mary, would like to come up and, and let you know what's happening. Alexander. Sorry. All right. My name is Mary Romanian, and I'm one of the ELO teachers here at Alexander. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our students. So we've got 111 active ELO students, which is about approximately 30% of our total um, K-6 student population. We have a very diverse group of students here. Some of the languages are French, Swahili, Vietnamese, Chinese. We have Fulani, Ewe, Arabic and many other languages. Um, some of the countries that are represented are Puerto Rico, Mexico, Honduras, uh, Congo, Togo, Mexico, Cameroon, Burundi, and more and more. So very diverse student population. Um, some of our students come here with um, having had a fairly consistent educational background, but that's kind of the exception. A lot of our kids have had interrupted or limited educational experiences. We have kids who've been in refugee camps for a couple of years before they've come here. Um, kids who have just moved around a lot. There have been a lot of transitions going on. So a lot of our kids have kind of um, either interrupted or limited educational experiences. We have um, two main um, educational models for yellow kids. One is the small group pull-out model, which is just as it sounds. We pull kids out of the classroom in small groups. Um, we pull them out according to their grade and their English language proficiency. And then we work with them in the ELL classroom. So groups of maybe three to five, three to six students. So really small groups in the ELL classroom. Um, we use a couple of different Curriculums. One is the On Our Way to English, and then we also use the H and H Journeys, which is the district's um, language arts curriculum. And then we modify that though so that it's appropriate for our kids. Um, newcomers get extended time, so they may even be pulled out two times during the day, or even three times, and get additional time. All right. Um, another model that I've been trying this year with a first grade classroom is a, is a co-teaching model where I go into a first grade classroom that has 12 out of her 20 students are ELL um, and her and I split the teaching time for the large group um, language arts time and then during the small group rotation time where um, it's about an hour, an hour long and each rotation is 15 minutes and they'll, a small group will go to Mrs. Kasparik and they will be working on whatever reading they need to um, specifically work on during that time. And then a small group of ELL students will come to me and work on language um, proficiency, language skills, and then the rest will be working independently on independent work and stations. Um, and this has been working very, very well. Um, I would love to use this more in more classrooms um, as the years go on. But it's, it's been a really, really good experience this year with that first grade class. Um, talk a little bit about our families. Um, we've been trying to do some family nights 
um, to um, develop relationships with the families between us and the families and for those families together um, as family bonding time. Um, the, our first one we did this year was um, fairy tale night. We met at the Broadway Neighborhood Center um, so that they have it's more accessible to our families. Um, they can walk there. Um, and we read a, a fairy tale um, and it was a little red riding hood if you can tell from the picture. Um, I had a couple teachers participate um, dressing up and I read a story to the kiddos um, and then we did an activity and we had snacks, um, we had a craft. And then we had a time where um, the, the parents could gather and we had interpreters and they could um, ask um, questions or we asked them questions, what do, what do you need from us, what do you want from us and gathered um, stuff from them that they would like um, more support from us. Um, and then we're going to try to do a photo book night um, at the end of April. I um, did this last year at Weber and it was very successful and it was a, a blast. I loved it and the kids loved it and the, parents, the families loved it. So we're going to try it here at, um, at Alexander um, where I got a, a grant from the Neighborhood Center's uh, one of their one of their grants um, was a five hundred dollar grant for supplies to do this photo night uh, photo book night, which we're I'm excited about. So we're gonna um, get a committee together um, of us ELL teachers and um, see if there's any interest with the, with the general education classroom teachers to join in that committee to plan that and and put that on for our kiddos and their families. Well, I'm in that, and um, our parents finally we love our parents, and um, we're hoping that they love us back. Um, and they want to be just as involved as their native speaking English parent counterparts. Um, but what we see is a need for literacy and um, the research overwhelmingly connects uh, parent education to the uh, creation of situations in homes that start conversations with um, how school going and reading together with their students. And so a successful thing that has gone on for the last year um, at Wood and Alexander's parent ESL Courses. Um, and so this actually the conversation began in fall of 2014 and then the classes launched at Wood Elementary, our neighbors over here, um, in January of 2015. And Stephanie Van Heusen and the student family advocates get total credit for their um, hard work, tireless labor to, to gather the funds for that and get the word out. And the great thing is that it was a parent initiated effort and um, we, they worked with the school district and got the neighborhood center, the Broadway Neighborhood Center on board uh, to provide resources. Um, and then after just six months um, and through the summer, they realized that it was spreading. Word of mouth was letting other parents know about, about the wood classes and so now it's into the Alexander proximity. And that's when I came on board this past January. This is kind of be a familiar face and then to offer a second intermediate level course because now those beginner students that have been there for eight months are more advanced in their English proficiency. Um, it is Monday nights, every Monday for two hours. The Neighborhood Center provides transportation and child care, uh, which is, um, there are no words for how wonderful that is. And then we have eight reliable community members that volunteer uh, to provide more one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two um, help. So last, uh, last spring it peaked at 40 students. So far um, we've had an average of about 20 students, uh, about, I don't know, 12 to 15 in the very beginner level class, and then I'm seeing about 10 come on a weekly basis. And so that's great. And again, like their, like their children, they are um, mostly from the Congo and Jordan refugee camps um, with language backgrounds, primarily in French and Swahili. No, I don't speak either one of those, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a fascinating experience. And, um, and they, they bring their kids with, and so I see them outside of class, and um, nothing but great things to say about this. And again, giving credit to Stephanie Van Hoosen, um, who launched this, and it's spreading. I know that it's, it's spreading over to the Spanish community, more towards Lemmy and Man, and so great things are happening there as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for your service. Uh, for this in particular. No, you can't. Are there any questions, Tom? Are there any questions? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I had a question. Oh, good. Okay, so 
one, it's a community partnership that has paid for that wonderful photo book. It's a community partnership. Community partnership. Because I'm the one that approved it. Oh, my God. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We appreciate that so much. We love it. No, I mean, it's great. And we, we, don't, we don't mind from a social service standpoint because we, we're serving some of the same families. So my, I guess one of the, my other question, maybe from a board standpoint, is I, from my own funding, we support a lot of the schools with these small $500 mini grants that we do. Is there, is there other opportunities for our district or other folks to help? I don't mind funding it. I mean, we get this much money, and we fund lots of the schools for these projects, but is there other ways that we can help support the, this type of effort, especially if we're in a corrective action situation with our ELL, do we not have $500? I mean, I don't care, I'll pay for it, it's not a problem, but do we have that if we know that we're in a corrective action and we've been in that for four going on plus years to be able to help support these things if they, because right now, the community is gonna support it and with the parents' ESL, e, ESL classes, et cetera, because we know it's a major need. Um, but you know, how else can we help garner a fund or something for these smaller things that are making huge impacts? Because we're never gonna be out of corrective action if we don't continue to partner with parents. Like, I mean, we just, we will never, whether that's proficiency or not, if we don't partner with our parents, it's just, look, we're gonna lose. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, how do we create some type of fund or something that these folks and these these uh, in our different schools that are doing these projects are able to utilize some of those funds because some of it is we don't have the funds in our school to do this. Can you help us? I'm going to write this grant. Well, sure, of course we're going to support that. But is there other options for our our, uh, our, our you know folks in our schools to be able to have access to those funds? Because usually ones I'm looking at is we don't have the funding for this. You know, and you know whether that's a family night. I mean, I fund tons of family nights. Etc. And so I'm always looking at, okay, what what can the schools do when we have such a limited budget as well, and we have to serve the entire county, not just our city mm -hmm. school district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the coordination of those efforts. I think Lisa would probably chime in and share. There's other sites that similar things are happening. Man's got an mm -hmm. awesome thing. That's Man happening. has a program that they've started. It's completely different, but they're they're also working with parents. Lucas has a program that they started as well. So is that is there like a fund for all of yes. We've been doing that through community education. Okay. So CDAP. So we're using those same dollars. Okay. And we have been receiving an immigrant grant, which mm -hmm. isn't guaranteed every year. It depends on how many immigrants we mm -hmm. have come in. And we use some of those funds to help with um, some additional tutoring and some of the materials for the parent class. <coughs> I think part of it is there's an initial debt to go around, so we deplete our community funds. Obviously, we access the community grant funds, and I think they're coming to you because we're running out of dollars inside. Right. Well, I'm just saying from a board, we were just asking about the summer school <coughs> about what we can do. Is there a way? I know sometimes with grant funding, they have very specific things that you cannot purchase mm -hmm. with those right. dollars. Some of that sometimes is food. So, yeah. and <laughs> you have to have that. food if you're doing an evening event with families. I mean, like, yeah. that's just crazy to not, I mean, I don't know how to put that nicely, but, um, so is there a way, is that where we're also reaching for our business partners, et cetera, to help us come up with funding, an additional funding source for these additional things that we're doing to bring parents into the school or to continue to help this group? I mean, because when we're looking at our, our ELL kiddos, that's also part of our proficiency with our reading, and so I think that's a very tangible thing that we can walk out of here with, let's set up a fund that businesses can potentially put dollars into to continue to support that effort. I mean, I mean, I will continue to, I've been, we've been doing it, I've been paying for stuff for the school district for about a decade. So I don't mind it, but I'm just saying is if there's other people that are willing, that might be a very tangible thing that we can walk out of here and say, we're putting money aside because we want to help during the school year and potentially summer. And my other question that I was trying to ask earlier was, are there any ELL teachers a part of our summer school that's helping also carry them through the summer as well? And I don't, I don't know that. I don't think we've had any. I just, to me, it just makes depends sense. Depends who applies. Who applies. Yeah, depends yeah who I just think it makes sense to make sure that we have mm -hmm. some of those teachers, if possible. I don't know what the other incentives are, but to make sure that they're part of that, that they can continue doing some of that same work. 
because we may be teaching without some of those additional yeah. skills and it might not help propel them to prevent the back uh, the somber slide, backslide, flip, whatever we call it. <laughs> but I, I don't know. So, so maybe we could um, partner a little bit to recruit more of those teachers, but really it just depends who applies first. Or yeah, I think that'd be great. I mean, to put it out there about the, 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 I think everybody realizes that's a part of the need, but those numbers overlap with our reading proficiency and science and math proficiency with our ELL students. And so I think it makes sense to have more of our ELL staff if possible. I know they're probably tired because, you know, they have some additional things they have to do. But, you know, I mean, it is. I mean, that's the reality, but there may be some of them that are willing and they should have some first priorities, especially in our schools that have higher populations like Alexander, mm -hmm. with a third of their school population being kids in ELL. I'm, I'm just putting it out there, y'all don't do that. <laughs> I'm gonna make two other, two, one other comment. Our school-based health clinic healthy kids serves lots of these kids. Mm -hmm. They come to our district um, mm -hmm. not having insurance or not knowing how to get insurance, and we help them and there's a hand, there's some that we end up being the primary care providers. Maybe we're closely with them and the university hospital. Okay. Okay. okay, I'm going to pull the plug on this. Thank you. Um, thank you. Everybody. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks very much. much. Thank you. Um, we're going to have to boot some things onto the next agenda. Uh, we still got junior high curriculum uniformity and the career thing and then the PE thing which Director Levy asked about at least a month ago. Uh, so we go, got those things. We've also got... Tom, can I interrupt for a minute? We do have some people that came for the PE part tonight, so if we can't oh. take them, could we at least recognize them? Or Absolutely. Okay. Sorry. Susie, if you want to... Yes. So we have two retired PE teachers I who are working on think I've met initiatives them. with us. So we have Karen Beggy and we have Diane DeRosier-Lar and so we we're going to present on three major initiatives that we've been involved in, and we have been the leader of two of them. Well, it's up to it's up to us whether we want to you know, continue here. Can go for it. Okay. Five minutes, she said. It's ten minutes. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. While they're getting set up, you guys all stand up. There you go. <laughs> oh, you thunder? <laughs> yeah, it's not fair. It isn't. <laughs> While you're standing up, part of the pep brand that I'm in charge of our project director, so we'll just do a little quick brain break because part of the initiative is working with classroom teachers and getting kids in the classroom and because 85% of us are kinesthetic learners and so if we can get them moving in the classroom. So um, one thing is just a little brain break. So take your hands out in front of you. Karen does this all the time. Cross your hands, turn your palms to face each other, interlock your fingers, and scoop through. Now cross your legs, put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, and then that, we're crossing our midline, and anytime we cross the midline of our body, we engage all four quadrants of the brain. Now, if you would look at your fingers and see if you can wiggle your right ring finger, wiggle your index finger on your left hand, and your ring finger on your right hand, left hand, oh, sorry, left hand, and now you may on and on. Can you do it while like whistling? <laughs> <laughs> Star Spangled Bay. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's part of this um, The PEP grant is just a three year grant, and um, this is the third, third time that the district has received the PEP grant, and it's a physical education program initiative, and it involves a lot of different things. So, so we are very lucky in our district to have gotten. This grant. So in total, we've brought into our community like 
$2.2 million within the last, um, since 2005. Um, this grant is just with four schools, and it was just based on higher poverty levels and lower performance academically. And um, it's how can we get our kids healthier? That's the initiative. Um, we use standards from Wisconsin, and it's just how can, because Iowa doesn't have any standards for physical education. Um, part of the initiatives are staff development for physical education teachers in the, in a, in the four schools that we have, um, across the board curriculum that um, all four of them use, and equipment. And you'll see some pictures real quick of some of the equipment that we have. We also help staff after school programs specifically to do activities in the after school programs that are age appropriate and involve nutrition or um, cooperative activities, um, character development. We fund uh, nutrition ed education for the four schools, pick a better snack, K through six. It's a phenomenal program. And we are helping fund part of the health curriculum that <coughs> we had a little hand in also making some decisions. And a lot of community partnerships and I'll show you a couple of those. And I think the biggest thing that's been, the best thing about this grant is developing the team, we call it building team group. And we pulled community members, you know, like recreation departments, um, the university, uh, parents, and a lot of the teachers to make some decisions about how you, they are gonna do in their individual schools to get their kids healthier. So, a couple of things I'm just going to show you. Uh, overhead projectors for the four schools so they can expand their technology and, and offerings. And it's also used with a lot of school assemblies. Climbing walls. All four schools have the climbing walls. Um, equipment like steps. Doing some different activities. Funding these little mats that are mats and different activities that the kids can do during PE physical education class. Um, just some different things that the kids can use, how to do it, sit up correctly, it has a little little stand. We have uh, little exercise bands, and again, these little mats that they use for a lot of different things. We've had people come in from the community for performance to help with after school, um, just uh, intramural type things or just activities. Um, are you a miler? The four schools participated, and Karen Bagby was the one that gave me all this, the ideas, or she helped me organize, and she did most, actually she did most of it. Are you a miler with all the kids, and they loved it. So in her initiative this year, she's got, she's got, how many? 21. 21 schools that are participating in that. Um, Heidi, oops, sorry. Heidi provided, like, snacks for the, um, Family Nights, um, Bicycle um, Coalition, Help with Bike Rodeos, um, University of Iowa uh, Safety Club, providing helmets for a lot of the bike, yes? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Someone uh, <coughs> you contacted me on a project. How many schools participate in uh, bicycle rodeos and things? Um, oh, oh, gosh. Uh, um, I believe there are 13 signed up for this. Fantastic. So it's, it's going up. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Melissa Matternack is our pick a better snack lady in all four schools, and she's phenomenal. And she brought like Heidi Chef to, to one of the initiatives. Iowa State Police Department comes and helps out with the bicycle rodeo. Bicycle Coalition also helped with repairing bikes. And these are some kids that are doing the Are You a Miler run. More pick a better snack. <laughs> And I think the biggest thing too right now is classroom teachers. We're having um, like the action-based learning it's called. And so um, we have like 16 teachers this summer that are gonna go to get certified so they can sustain this activity in the classroom to look for learning. Um, and we just, we have like family nights, bicycle rodeos, over that and this is like another family night where they're talking helping parents what are you gonna if you have math problems 
How can you as a parent help your student with petitions, traction, um, another activity in the family nights, more bicycle rodeo, we had lots of. And then one of the schools had a family running club and very popular. They also do the running clubs during the, the day. Bicycle rodeo, and we had <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and our action-based learning labs are, um, there's a classroom in, Mr. Ridley kid had a little story about that one. Um, there's a, uh, Kirkwood has a learning lab, which a classroom can take their students into this lab if you see them getting a little antsy or you want them to work on spelling words or math facts, while they're balancing on a board, they can, somebody can flash a card. I know I'm going over. Um, or <laughs> you can dribble while they're adding or subtracting, juggling a ball while they're saying the sight words that they need to learn. Um, also, they can just get on the bikes or the ellipticals, flash cards or spelling words while they're doing that balance. balance. Beam, and then this is one of the ELL classrooms that she had them getting up and moving to write, and um, she had a ladder, the spelling words, or the words that she wanted them to learn, and they would move from one to the other, um, and they would help each other. One of the students, he didn't know a word, so the guy behind him said, well, that's this, and so by the third time he went through the ladder, then he's like, oh yeah, that's what that word is. So this is our third year, our timeline will be completed, and our data will be put together, and our budget should be balanced. But these are just some of the data. We're just finishing up what, um, this is a survey, nutrition survey, and pedometers the students wear. And year one, two, and three, just like at Grantwood, we love to see this progress. So the initiatives that they're doing um, are making a difference. And then we can take this information back to the building teams and they can make some decisions. What's working, what's not, what do we need to do? And then fitness tests. We also, our data is fitness testing. So um, this was the fall of 2014 and the spring of 2015 and we're finishing up our third year here. But there's some significant growth too. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to present and tell you what the CAP grant's all about. So the other initiative is Fuel Up to Play 60, and this is something we got involved in um, two years ago, and it's with Midwest Dairy Council and then the, the National Football League, so NFL. And Karen is our coach through Midwest Dairy Council. Hi. Um, I taught in the district for over 30 years, so it's like I'm at home. And uh, I took on this position because it's a great transition and it keeps me in with kids and keeping them physically um, active and healthy. And Fuel Up to Play 60 is um, through the NFL, which the boys and girls love, and the Dairy Council. And um, I'm going to just minus two music, thanks to my son, so I won't be over four minutes and 20 seconds and and I felt that it was best for you to see what this is about and last year we were in nine schools it's the second year in Iowa City nine years in um, less than nine schools and this year 18 so you get to listen to some music and uh, um, are you gonna be ready to do Diane I'm not talking so I need to do this one. you know what I muted it earlier are you muted me? Because it's should play. But it's supposed to have music. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Oh, here we go. I got it.
It was pajama day. <laughs> <laughs> publication and Van Allen is featured in that. The third initiative was the Blue Zones project. I don't know so much about this, I won't go into it. So you know the community achieved certification and we were a big part of that. Um, we had six designated schools, our goal was four, we had six, and then the walking school buses. So last fall, you can see the ones that are there. This spring we have quite a few more. Um, and plan then is we're going to continue to designate schools. We, the District Walk and Wellness Committee has now has members from the Walking School Bus Committee, so we're working together. And then the Community Power 9, which I'm a member of, we will continue to meet quarterly and work with the state to maintain certification and to add designated schools. And one thing about um, Walking School Bus, the Johnson County Department of Public Health has offered to um, help us look at walkability of um, routes around school. They've done this in the past, and they have um, Iowa students that are coming to do this. So as you think about busing issues, you might want to think about looking at walkability around schools. So we're going to have them go to Maine. This is April 26th. They use a CDC tool for diseases. Um, diseases and Thank you. <laughs> CDC, disease control. So um, think about that if you have some other schools they could do. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Can we get all the PowerPoints attached to the agenda? Is that possible? I think most of them are. Yeah. As of late today, they were. Did you get They're all on there? Most of them, not all. Of them. Okay. Susie's had them, no. The other two were. I just agree with one of them. Yeah. Okay. Did you like the music? Yeah, it's great. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't talk. Music and pictures are always good. All right. Shall we move to agenda setting now? Probably have too much again, but um, we are we agreed to bump uh, D and E on here since uh, just took care of F. We've also got weighted resources to talk about. Mm -hmm. We can call um, that one class size goals. Okay, you agree? Class size goals. Same thing, but yeah, it's not the same thing. Two different things. It's called class size goal. Um, uh, I would I would like to talk about um, teacher allocation um, in ref in uh, regards to need of school, which would be different from aspirational goals. Right. And then uh, you, we're supposed to hear about year-round schools next time. Right. Get that written down. Um, do we do we have room for uh, something on the FOSS science program and how that ties in with backyard gardens and uh, school gardens since it will be somewhat timely? Um, it depends. Well, we could. 
If we don't know anything, Steve, about the ESSA at the moment, or any updates? Or no, the state, uh, actually, right now, tonight, uh, the state has to have a series of public input uh, meetings. There's one taking place up at the Grand Wood Education Agency tonight, so I doubt they'll have any feedback from that okay. by that time. All right, so um, we're still looking at junior high school curriculum uniformity, career, trade, and tech, um, year-round school, uh, and the combination of weighted resources, class size goals, teacher allocation. We, I don't know how we're going to separate all that exactly, but we'll figure it out. Uh, and then I've got the FOSS. Couple of backyard abundance okay. of school gardens. Right. Yeah, I, I, you know, anything that's seems to me anything that's timely ought to be bumped up. But because I mean, some of these things are, some of them are a little more informational, and some of them are things that need to be taken care of. Uh, some things lending more to discussions and information provision. Um, well, with this list, we'll try to establish a uh, try to establish an order of uh, importance and things we think we can get to in the in the allotted time without having the education meeting going on for uh, a long time. Although all the stuff that's informational is always really good, so <laughs> you know that part's that part's great. Uh, uh, Anything else for the uh, agenda or anything else you want to? Well, I've got a couple of things, but I don't know if I think that's pretty full. But uh, there was a community member that approached me that wanted to talk about community outreach, mainly how we can involve parents that aren't involved in schools, that type of thing, working, working that way. And uh, I think we can start a Grantwood AEA conversation soon enough uh, on, you know, auditing it or uh, trying to opt out of it, uh, that type of a thing, or at least getting them to be a uh, advocate for us instead of uh, the other way around. Okay. Anything else? All right, may I have a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> Adjourn. Second from Phil, then. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, folks. Come back.